Hey, Eric, how's it going? Oh, not bad. So I'm here with uh, Morgan John Fox, the director of The Hobby, documentary about, I guess, uh, car trading and everything that goes along with that. I guess the obvious first question is, are you involved in The Hobby or what brought you to this documentary to begin with? Yeah, I'm involved in The Hobby. I started as a, a kid in the 90s. I was one of those, like, in that boom, sort of the golden era of The Hobby I uh, collected and then grew out of it and then got back into it um, several years ago and then ended up sort of in the right place at the right time, got this gig to direct a documentary about uh, this crazy world of card collecting, which I never would have imagined uh, would have been, been something I would have had the opportunity to do. It's always cool when there's like some niche thing that you're involved in and then suddenly you can get sort of a, a job in that world. But yeah, it's been really exciting. Of course, I, I've met a bunch of new people and learned a lot through making the documentary, which is also like one of my favorite parts of the film industry in general is just getting to sort of enter into these worlds that you otherwise wouldn't have access to. Uh, so it's been really cool. Yeah, one of the cool things about this documentary is it kind of, uh, and I wish it didn't, but it kind of did. Uh, once I was done with this, I went down a YouTube rabbit hole. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if that's a good thing or not, but it definitely uh, definitely piqued my interest enough to look into it further. Oh, cool. I like that. I mean, yeah, I think that's that's what's interesting is that we, you know, it's a giant world. It's a lot bigger. If, if folks maybe were aware of it when they were younger or whatever else, uh, it has grown so much, you know, and we look at all aspects of that world. We, you know, we talk to collectors and card shops. We go to card shows. We're at auction houses. We're behind the scenes at grading companies. You know, some folks might, might not even known this was a thing. Uh, also, like with investors, you know, it's not just collectors. It's not just the passion. There's there are people literally uh, solely in this for investing purposes. Uh, so uh, there is a lot to investigate in that world. It's not just about people who collect little pieces of cardboard. Uh, uh, that that this world has grown exponentially. And I think it's an interesting sort of look into a world that people might or might not know much about. I don't know if you would know the answer to this, but one of the things I was thinking of, you had the, the card companies. They're the ones that can print the cards. What's to stop them from uh, just printing out a Black Lotus and selling it for a million dollars or printing out a Michael <laughs> Jordan or whatever and selling that for whatever it is? Great question um when i started collecting in the 90s that was a big you know a big aspect that we found out like everyone thought like because uh because cards were thrown away from people who collected in the 50s and whatever else then in the 90s everyone kept their cards they were like these are gonna be really valuable you gotta keep them and that was a big boom well we look back and several years later you find out that there was like hundreds of millions of each card being printed right and so all those cards once the internet came around and people could track that uh, they became useless. They became worth basically nothing. What happened in that world is that over time, people started to serial number cards um, and grade cards. And so the serial numbering obviously is, makes it a unique number that it can there can only be a, a single one of one theoretically. should only be one. And or like if there's something out of 10, it's a one out of 10 or a two out of 10. And because all of those cards that are extremely valuable or, you know, serial numbered or, or valuable for whatever reason, basically everyone grades them these days. And those grading companies, one, authentic, authenticate the, the card to say that it's real. It's the original copy. Uh, and then also give it a grade based on its condition. And so now because of the, the, the sort of certification of those cards, it's, it's becomes harder and harder. I'm not saying that there isn't still shady situations where people might print fake cards or something. Uh, but it becomes harder and harder because it's all trackable and traceable uh, because of, of them being certified and authenticated. That's what prevents that now. Um, but, you know, there's still been some wild stuff. You know, Logan Paul spent $6 million on a case of what he thought were original first edition Pokemon cards. And uh, once they, uh, and, that, and that case was authenticated by the leading authenticator of sealed cases. Well, he cracked those open because some people started questioning the authenticity as they looked at its provenance in the background. Well, he cracked it open on a live stream and it was, someone had resealed old boxes inside of this case and, they, and stuffed like packs of G.I. Joe cards in them. <laughs> and so that's $6 million that just turned into zero. Um, and he had to like track that down. I think he got his money back. But point being like, you know, 
the shady stuff can still happen, but I think it's safer now than it's ever been. Also, this documentary is pretty dense. I, I imagine there was a bunch of uh, stories or bits that didn't make it into the documentary. What's some more interesting stuff that you had to leave on the cutting room floor? Maybe even to the point where you're like, I really don't want to, but this just doesn't fit here. Yeah, well, we filmed at one of the manufacturers. Um, and uh, we thought that that would have been, we only we only sort of got, the capability of filming there last minute. Um, and so I think had we spent more time there, we could have uh, woven them into the storyline better. But because of how dense it is, like you mentioned, you know, we have a lot of rich characters to sort of represent the different aspects and worlds of, of this hobby. Um, and at some point you just have to stop the, too many characters. And so filming one of the manufacturers, I think is a really unique thing to be able to see uh, that we unfortunately just couldn't fit into the final product. Also, looking at your IMDb, you got uh, writer, director, producer, edit- editor, actor, cinematographer, <laughs> production manager, sound design. Uh, yeah, you, do, yep. you do everything. Like, How does um, wearing all those hats kind of help you with your filmmaking? I mean, the answer seems obvious, but I'd like to hear it from someone who actually walked the walk, so to speak. Yeah, well, I mean, I came up in this like the truly DIY. I mean, my first feature film when I was 21. And it was literally like me and my friends, like I would hold the camera, they would hold the boom mic and we would sometimes alternate. So we would both like each scene, like change who was filming it just so we would have different and uh, you know, hook or crook, zero budget, like true micro or zero budget films. And so you had to wear all those hats. I had to edit my own film because there was no budget to hire another editor. You know, I had to shoot it because there was no, we didn't, we couldn't hire a cinematographer. Um, and so that's how that all came to be. And acting is really just like a friend wanted, like, you know, can you come back to my thing? I don't really pursue acting, uh, but I'd like to do it occasionally just so I can work with actors more fluently just to understand what they go through. Um, yeah. So a lot of that stuff truly came, was by necessity of being a DIY filmmaker, um, and sort of growing up in that world. Um, and you know, now I love working with professional. I love having a cinematographer because I love nothing else than just being able to direct, uh, truly. Uh, it is so nice to just focus, you know, um, I'm not precious about those things. I did them out of, uh, having to, uh, and we'll, we'll still, if I have to, I think it's always good to have a diverse, uh, skill set, Right. Um, I'm also not just a documentary filmmaker. I mean, I've made more narrative films and documentaries, um, but it's fun to have variants in life and jump jump into projects that are exciting. So you were a first assistant director on one of our favorites, The Death of Dick Long. Oh yeah. What? Uh, t- tell me anything you can about that because we love that movie. Absolutely love. Yeah, it. Yeah, that was so fun to to work on. And, and Daniel Shiner, who's one half of the Daniels, who did everything everywhere all at once. Uh, such an incredible director to work with. I mean, just so smart. Uh, so kind and generous. Um, one of the best sets I've ever worked on. Um, yeah, I mean, that film was so fun. We were in Alabama. You know, filming on location is one of my, the funnest things. So it's like summer camp for filmmakers where you all go. Most people travel in and you all find like Airbnbs to stay in or you stay in a block of hotels, whatever it might be. And we're all just like in this thing together for 12 hours a day for like two months. Uh, and that film was just wild. I mean, uh, you know, as you know, from seeing the film, it's wild. Uh, we had to we had to pull off a lot of stunts and and uh, things with not a giant budget. I mean, we worked with A24, who are really lovely to work with, luckily. Um, but, you know, pulling together resources in true sort of middle of nowhere, Alabama. We we're in Bessemer, Alabama, outside of Birmingham um, and working with some great locals there as well. Uh, just a lot of fun. I don't know if I had any specific instance, you know, work. We did all, all you know, every stunt you can imagine, you know, working with animals horses oh. working with dogs we had to <laughs> set stuff on fire yeah uh you know <laughs> they were movie horses movie just movie horses uh we didn't get weird as they said in the movie but yeah i mean i would jump at any chance to work with daniel he's uh so so great and it was a lovely movie a lot of fun well- well, on the show, we have a uh, what's in the box segment. And in the box, we have people put uh, movies that uh, they think are underseen. They're like, oh, that was really good. And no one ever talks about it. And then every week we pull a movie from the box and watch and talk about it the following week. What's a movie you would like to put in the box that you think maybe should get more eyeballs on it? Oh, um, OK. So I have is just one. I you can do two, three, you can do 10 if you want, as long as we got time. Okay, uh, Doom Generation by Greg Araki. 
um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe on the, maybe in this world, it's not underseen, but uh, I lo- I'm a huge Gregor Eckert fan. So any of his early movies, Doom Generation or Nowhere um, are two of my favorite, just like gritty, like true all tour driven movies. Um, and then, I mean, one of my favorite films uh, of all time is called Wild Reads by Andre Tachine. Um, it's a French movie. Um, that is the movie that made me want to make films. Um, hard to find, I will say. Um, so that might not be a great suggestion because I don't even know if you can, like you can't can't buy it on streaming anymore. Maybe you can rent it on Amazon. Um, but those three are like, uh, to me, sort of like some of my favorites. And then like, I don't know, early Harmony Corinne, Gummo or, or like Julian Donkey Boy, like incredible movies, but I think enough, uh, probably enough people, the people who want to see those movies have seen them. Uh, <laughs> if you haven't sought those out, you probably shouldn't watch them. Uh, pretty wild, dark movies. Uh, that's kind of my sort of uh, throwing them against the wall. All right. Well, uh, Morgan, thank you for joining me today. And uh, The Hobby comes out February 16th on digital and uh, yeah, uh, it's really dense, really interesting. And like I said, uh, if you want to watch it, be careful because you will go right to YouTube almost immediately after. And it's just one of those kind of docs. And I, I think that's a measure for a good one. So congratulations. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to come and speak today. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone tunes in on Friday. Download Rent it anywhere you can download and rent movies online. And uh, yeah, again, appreciate it for spreading the word.